Good afternoon, everybody. We're going to get started here in another minute or two while everybody gets signed on. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to this week's NACTA webinar. My name is Dana Leroy. I'm the Communications Manager for NACTA. And if you missed it yesterday, we had a big announcement regarding virtual programming across all of our affiliate associations. Since the cancellation of this summer's convention in Las Vegas, we have been working very hard to build out a schedule of virtual sessions for members in an effort to provide professional development during these challenging times. If you haven't seen the complete schedule of dates and times for these events, I encourage you to check it out on NACTA.com. Now we are shifting gears this week to talk about the fans. Today's session is titled, Understanding Fan Fears. Is this a revolution or an adjustment? We don't know when and how fans will return to our facilities, but in the meantime, it is important for athletics departments to plan efficiently and intelligently for when that day comes. We are joined today by Drew Burst, Practice Director, Collegiate Sports at Dimensional Innovations, and Dr. Kevin Booley, Senior Litigation Consultant with Persuasion Strategies. Drew has been working in the sports facility industry for over 12 years and has been involved in over $2 billion worth of athletics facility projects. At DI, Drew is the single point of accountability for all collegiate sports clients. Kevin has been active in litigation consulting since 2001. His master's degree in forensic psychology and doctorate in legal communication focus on persuasion, small group influence, and jury decision making. His areas of experience include intellectual property, products liability, complex commercial, medical malpractice, sports related injury disputes, and more. Before we begin, a reminder for our live attendees that you may ask questions during the webinar using the Q&A feature within the Zoom window. We will have a lot of time for questions after the presentation. This live stream is also being broadcast on NACTA's YouTube channel. So for those of you who might have colleagues who may not have been able to join via Zoom, they can still tune in to the live session by going to youtube.com slash ADNACTA. And as with previous sessions, a recording of this webinar, as well as the presentation slides will be made available to all registrants via email, as well as NACTA and affiliates members via the NACTA daily review. And with that, I'm gonna step away and let Drew and Kevin begin the discussion. Fantastic. Thank you all. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Dana. Thank you to NACTA uh, for letting us do this. We're, we're very excited. Um, and first of all, dude, Kevin, I wish I'd have read uh, your resume prior to this. You sound a little more fancy than mine. Um, <laughs> so, hey, you know, such is life. Two billion. Um, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Doctor. Doctor's always strong. Um, so, yeah, again, thank you guys for joining us. And uh, I'm hopeful that more people have logged on than both of our mothers, um, but uh, hey, we'll go with it. So you know, our, our purpose here today is, is you know, what, the, what the title says, right? Understanding you know, with the, the craziness of the world today, um, right? We hear so much about regulations and, um, right, and the restrictions and, and the, the different restrictions of different places. Uh, really where Kevin and I both come from, uh, from a philosophy standpoint is that, you know, you've got to dig deeper than that to understand people, um, and understand their motivations. And while we come from different backgrounds, um, it's, it's still kind of arrives in the same place. So we'll talk to you about that and, uh, how we've gone about applying our expertise to, to understanding fans. So let me quickly explain here, um, kind of who we are. So obviously intros. Uh, so I lead our, our at Dimensional Innovations. I lead our college sports practice. So you guys know our background. We are uh, really in the industry known as experiential designers, uh, designers and builders. So we have uh, you know over 300 people, been in the business 26 years, seven offices, 
200,000 square feet of build space and uh, all the expertise you can imagine that goes into fan experience solutions, right? Everything from technology, uh, you know, to uh, we have one of the world's largest 3D print structures that's going up right now um, to your very traditional, uh, you know, signage, graphics, wayfinding pieces. So there's just a quick sampling of our work. Um, but today is a little more about um, what we care about, right? Which is, is, is the passion of fans, what motivates them to do things. And now what is that motivation? How is it impacted in, in light of COVID? And, and then, right, trying to pre pre predict to a certain extent, what's the timeline of that impact? So that really is where I went to Kevin. So Kevin's one of, one of my best friends on earth and um, he's way smarter than I am. And it's, is, the, is why I brought him, asked him to help me on this. And in particular, what I really appreciated about Kevin was he has no bias about sports. He only cares about um, understanding people and their behavior, why they think what they do and, and do what they do. Um, so Kevin, let me have you explain a little bit more about your company and what you do. And please keep in mind, Kevin does not come from a design company as you can see. So his slides not as pretty. Uh oh, do we lose Kevin? There you go, buddy. Kevin, you back? Back. Sorry, blipped out for a second. So, if, did you catch the end of that? Can you kind of give us a rundown on your history, background, expertise? I think the most relevant thing to think about is that my background, you know, for about the last nineteen years, is in studying people, how they make decisions, and particularly how they resolve conflict. So. The examples that Dana read um, and, or, or mentioned from my, you know, my bio really focus on litigation. That's the, the bread and butter of what I do. So lawsuits where there's really two different conflicting versions of, of reality and then how juries, judges, arbitrators make decisions and resolve those different versions of reality. So applied to what we're talking about today, you know, that's, that's things like looking at why do uh, requirements to wear a mask uh, lead to very different reactions from people. Why do some people zig when other people zag? Um, why is it that when we're all asked to stay at home um, for two months, some people want to buck that uh, that authority and some people want to uh, live it to the rule? So um, that idea of just how people resolving uh, how people resolve conflict and how to study and how to evaluate what motivates people's reasons for the decisions that they make in in the face of those conflicts is 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 really what what our group does. And I just put an example of on this slide, um, just of a recent demonstration that um, what, a lot of what we are doing now is evaluating people's reactions to the pandemic uh, and counseling those we work with on, on what it means for their business. And uh, to sort of add to that, right? So you, you might ask, okay, well, what's a, given Kevin's background, which, which is mostly in the legal world, first of all, law firms pay better. That's one reason you do that. But why does that apply here, right? The exact same principles are, are what we're looking for. We're about to ask a whole bunch of people with different feelings to come together again in uncertain times. We need to understand their fears. We need to understand what they're actually worried about. Because again, um, you know, we, we really believe that's different than the guidelines, right? That's different than, than the narratives that are out there. Um, so how do we go about doing that? Um, what we did is, is um, right. This was sort of our, our, our thinking. Um, there isn't really a precedent for this unless you go back to 1918 or whatnot. And why this says, you know, no one knows a damn thing. I realize that's strong language, but the truth is everybody's trying to figure it out. Um, so what can you really measure in this time? What can we really understand to help us make decisions and plan? Um, and, and at the end, right, from our perspective, it's time to sort of set aside the TED Talks and prognosticating Right, we don't want to prey upon the fears of, of fans or the, fa the you know the fears of our clients. You know, athletics departments. It's a time to listen. It's a time to truly understand facts and science, right? And it's a time to be thoughtful about how we respond to that. So, this is really the hypothesis of our survey research exercise. Um, you know, so oftentimes in moments like this, or if you look at a company that's developing a product, product or service. They can often get lost, often get lost um, in the development of that, and forget about who it's for. Um, 
right? Guidelines, as I mentioned, are a great example. That's, that's establishing a, you know, some minimum standard of care, um, right? Based upon the best information available, but it, again, doesn't really consider the end user and their true concerns. And because it's a new frontier, right? I'm not sure waiting to have more information come out is the best plan. Um, I believe, you know, we do need to plan for the most complicated scenarios um, in a layered way, right? And in a temporary way, because again, pandemics end. Um, I'm not a believer that this is forever going to change the, the you know, the frontier of sports. Um, it, I'm a believer that, that it is some level of temporary, whether it be a season or two, um, right? And so to do this, right, to start to figure that out, we start with the clients, the fans, if you will, not the regulations. And then we reverse engineer into the regulations and the important points. And what we've done to do that first step was a survey. And right, this is different than a send out a link and answer these questions. This is where Kevin comes in. So Kevin, if you don't mind, can you give um, some explanation as to the survey methodology? You kind of why what you do is different than what others might have seen. What we what we aimed for with this survey was to be able to evaluate um, sports fans across all four more all four major regions of the country, and find out um, from that unbiased audience what they're thinking about as as their views and fears of the coronavirus pandemic intersect with their hopes and dreams for for living the life that they've gotten used to. And so we, I think, you know, in talking about this, we appreciate that you all have gotten feedback through your networks, that you all have gotten feedback from um, your constituents, people um, that you work with, even, um, even more informally, friends, family, and, and understood at some level what people are thinking about reconvening in large groups. And what we hope to do with this approach is, is really tap into um, what's a more public, what's, what's a more um, kind of general population reaction. And we're all seeing the data come in from national polling organizations like Gallup and Pew and, and others that's telling us what people are saying and thinking uh, uh, about what's going on. Um, but this particular survey, we, we surveyed 596 people who are sports fans. And what that meant was they either um, said that they at least occasionally attend a large sporting event um, or that they are interested in sports and interested in hearing about sports. And like I said, we represented um, portions of all of the four major regions of the US, that being the Northeast, the Midwest, the South, and the West. And, and our goal with this approach is like Drew said, to start with the first week of May, so May 5th through the 7th, we surveyed these folks and got feedback from them. And we're gonna ask them um, the same types of questions uh, a couple more times over time to see how those reactions may change. And, and, and that should give us a sense, uh, a proxy in these different regions and throughout the country as to how views are changing and how the passage of time and the passage of new events um, might be shifting their views. Yeah, and, and right, so from our perspective, um, you know, as we look at planning experiences, as we look at planning the live events, right, we, we care about how does somebody feel now and that's what we need to communicate to knowing we can adjust as fears change or as concerns change. Therefore, right, the surveys over time as we move closer to whatever start date is, we can plan for a scenario now, right, that might ideally is worst case scenario, but make it very easy to adapt accordingly as both you know, sentiment and, and uh, regulations change. So let's talk about a couple things we learned and we'll start with the high level of, of, of our takeaways from the survey results. Um, first, you know that a majority of folks are concerned about the pandemic and of course your response is, uh, well, no kidding. But what this is important for two reasons. First, it's important because gathering this data from our particular sample of sports fans allows us to use that as a variable to tell us what is the difference between somebody who's very concerned or somewhat concerned? Are those uh, factors leading to different perceptions of, of their own safety at sports events? Are those factors leading to different uh, ultimate responses as to whether or not these, these folks would go to a sporting event tomorrow or not for another year? 
Um, the second reason is this gives us some uh, confirmation that our sample looks like uh, what the national polling results are, are uh, returning. So in, it, um, in multiple other surveys uh, nationally, this number of about two thirds of Americans saying that they're very or somewhat concerned about the coronavirus pandemic uh, maps directly onto the results of this particular survey uh, looking just at sports fans. So that gives us some, um, some corroboration and some reassurance that we're getting you know, a reasonable assessment of, uh, of people and their different levels of concern. And Kevin, I should add, so our survey was what, 15 questions long, somewhere there about, right? That's right. It was it was less than ten minutes to complete. So um, yeah, it was between fifteen and twenty questions, kind of depending on how you look at it. And, and so um, to explain this, you know, to put this into practice, knowing that sixty six percent right are somewhat or very concerned. Well, if if then the question asked later of you know will, will you attend a, a live sporting event, if you know that some people aren't concerned at all, or are kind of concerned, or are very concerned yet they're all willing to go to an event, you've got a problem, right? You have a conflict uh, on how those people will then behave. So to kind of understand why that really matters, of course, people are afraid, but that's why it matters in this case. Yeah, exactly. And, and conflict is really, I think, the theme of what we are seeing with these results. And this is a good example. You know, we just talked about concern over the virus, which is, I think, pretty ubiquitous. Um, but we also measured, you know, extremely positive uh, perceptions that uh, the atmosphere and experience of live sporting events is better than any option that people have available to them now. So you see 77% of our, of our uh, survey respondents said that <clears throat> the atmosphere of live sporting events is better than watching on TV. And that number might be increased by the situation that we're all in, staying at home and not having fewer options. Um, but the conflict here is people are concerned about the virus, but they also value uh, being present at live events. Um, and, and, and so that's that's something we're gonna keep talking about. Yeah, and sorry for the terminology for the folks on the call. This is what I like to call the core value, the core product of a live sporting event, right? The atmosphere. That is something you cannot get anywhere else, right? That just bone rattling those moments. So now, interesting moment, right? You have people that are concerned about going back, coming back together, but at the same time, you know, starving to come back together um, and experience this atmosphere. So how do we transition that, right? How do we plan for that? That's really, again, kind of how we put this into practice. And we also saw that, um, if you want to move to the next slide, Drew, yeah, we also saw that, that people do uh, report wanting to attend sporting events um, as much because it's a return to normal as because they missed the events themselves. So about 35% of our respondents said that they, they wanna go to a sporting event and they would attend a sporting event um, because they missed them. Uh, but a, another 30% said they wanna go to a sporting event just because they wanna feel normal again. And, and I think we're all in a world of, uh, of looking at what normal is and how soon there will be a normal like we used to have and my interpretation of what, what we're hearing and, and, and what we can think about with these results is, you know, part of what people want is they want to go back and have a satisfying experience of doing the things that they like. And it may not look or, or feel exactly like it used to, but the desire to get back to a feeling of authority, of control, and of participating in the things they like um, is 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 motivating um, for people to come back, and so that obviously has implications that you know Drew can speak to about what kind of experience do you want to provide when when folks do come back to these arenas, these stadiums. Yeah, the, you know that's again right conflict. So people want normal. Totally understand. They're, they're, the the positive in this is that right our our core hardcore fans are still there. Everyone's everyone has always said. Many people have always said. You know, sports is recession proof. This kind of proves that to be true, that right, that that sports really do, you know, the loyalty is still there. Um, however, this also tells us we need to start messaging right now. Um, you're not gonna come back to normal, right? Depending on when, when we start, right, and, and the regulations, but we can start to say, okay, it may not be normal when you come back. Um, we acknowledge that we can still make this fun. Like this can still be, we can all remember right, the season of COVID, um, 
right? As we get back to normal. Yeah, and it's it's. I'm sure some of you have seen some of the debates on on ESPN and other other um, outlets that are talking about the NBA season. And if the NBA season comes back, will it be somehow, uh, you know, a lesser championship team than in past years? Will there be some asterisk next to the season that devalues what these players and uh, and their fans are experiencing? And and I always have been intrigued by the take that. Um, this should be more important than ever, right? That this having fan, having a uh, champion to crown is more important this year than maybe it ever has been. And so it's not a slight, it's actually an elevation of the, of the importance. And I think that to me, that's what I hear Drew saying um, about what the fan experience could be and how, uh, how it could impact what you're providing. And that kind of leads perfectly to this. Right, so, so from, from the survey, again, we can start to dig into what actually, well, you can look either way, what people are truly deeply concerned about um, and or what will give them peace of mind. You wanna to speak to this, Kevin? So again, we see conflict that people are missing their sports events, that at least the, the, the hardcore fans um, are willing and ready to come back. And we're gonna talk more about that in a minute. But what you see across our survey respondents is that people are most scared of, of other people and specifically other fans and members of the public. Um, and so, you know, this, this again puts us kind of squarely in the, in the box of trying to figure out how we evaluate these competing desires and these competing fears that, that, that our, our fans and our tar target audience are telling us they're feeling. Um, and this is, this is what we hope to talk more about in the next few minutes and, and give you some more thoughts about. Yeah, and this right perfect example. You know, so around the country, you're seeing some lifting of certain restrictions. And we're seeing that people don't have any idea what that really means, that some people are taking that as a free-for-all. I just experienced it myself because I am someone who falls into the category of quite concerned, um, right? I have three children. I have parents over the age of 70, um, right? We have people in our family with medical issues. I went to Home Depot this weekend and around here, Kansas City, some restrictions were lifted. You have people, no mask, right? Wandering about as if there are no rules. And I was completely freaked out, um, but understand that others feel completely differently. Um, but that is a real problem um, if we're, you know, if we're going to have events um, with, you know, some level of restrictions in place or with more importantly, with deep fears still in place. So we wanted to dig a little bit deeper on some of those big picture findings and, and talk a little more about the conflict that we're seeing from these responses and, and, and then obviously talk about some ideas uh, for what we wanna to do to address them or what could be done to address them. Um, but to, to, to kick off on, on what we're learning about um, people's willingness to go back to events, perhaps not at all surprising to all of us, fans are divided. You know, just like Americans tend to be divided on so many issues today, um, including their general response to the virus, how it's being handled. That's how people are responding to the idea of going back to stadiums. Um, so just a couple of numbers to look at that track really well with what national pollsters are saying about the American public response to uh, reopening. And so that first bullet there, you see that depending on the, the, the specific circumstances that we asked, about 15 to 20% of our respondents said that they're, they're ready to attend a sporting event in the next couple of weeks without any limits. So they're saying if, if there are no restrictions put on the facilities for attendance levels um, and, and otherwise, as long as the event is meeting kind of local and, um, and state guidelines for health, then, then they're willing to go. Um, on the other end of that spectrum, about 10% say that they're never gonna go to a sporting event. Um, based on the different scenarios we provided in, in the survey. And, and the reason I said this tracks really consistently with national results is um, a recent poll by Gallup that was conducted just about two weeks ago showed that about 21% of Americans say they're ready now to reopen and they're ready now to do everything like they used to do. Um, that 21% is really consistent with our 20%. And then in that Gallup poll, 12% said they're not ready to go back out and, and reopen until there is a vaccine. Um, again, pretty consistent with this 10 or so percent of our survey respondents who said um, they're, they're, they're never gonna go back to a sporting event. Um, so you have those as kind of the polls. 
And then in the middle, you have this big chunk of, you know, two thirds or so of our respondents who, who, are, who are saying that they, they will go to an event um, if the events are right, uh, excuse me, if the circumstances are right and if the timing is right. Yeah, and the, right, the, again, conflict obviously being a theme. The, the challenge there is, right, certain people will take the um, political um, or government guidelines as kind of the measure, um, whereas you'll probably, not probably, we know you have medical experts that completely disagree with the lifting of, of certain uh, sanctions or certain guidelines. Um, so again, conflict, conflict and, and viewpoint. So when will people come back? What, what are they telling us uh, about when they're ready to come back? Again, we talked about a minority is ready to attend now. Um, a small minority say they're never going to attend. Um, but everybody else is kind of in the middle and you see these bottom bullets that tell us a few things. Um, specifically what we saw is, is, you know, most say that in the next six months, if masks are required at the event, um, people say they would be comfortable attending. Um, 53% said that they'd be willing to attend in the next two to five months if the facility uh, was at half capacity. 51% say they would attend in the next two to five months if everyone was required to wear, uh, to wear masks. And so you see um, that there is some differential, but that there is a willingness, uh, at least in what people say they will want to do in the next couple months if uh, you know, some reasonable precautions are taken. Yeah, and we'll talk a uh, little further down here about uh, how that, again, how can we put that into practice? And, and when we talk about why did they say they want to come back, it's what we've mentioned before, um, that people are missing the experience. They want to, they want to feel normal again. Um, but I think the important point here is we've got showing you that 44% of your, your more diehard sports fans, these are people who we measured um, or classified as uh, heavy attendees. They, they told us that they attend you know, five or more pro games and five or more college games every year um, prior to the pandemic. And so at the, in that particular group, um, it's a higher proportion of people who say they'll go in the next six months just because they want to get back to normal. So these are folks who are motivated to live their lives the way that they want to and to do the things that they say make them uh, or that they, that they typically do and that we know that make them happy. So, um, you know, that's, that's a, a core reason why people say they want to get back, especially your big fans. And you might, might imagine for folks on the call, right, as you dig further into that, those statistics, that varies by age, right? It varies by region when you know what that percentage is. So again, we're looking at a slice of America. Um, we'll talk more about, right, the, the importance of then going, going further. Yeah, and I think the question is just so, so if the, if the diehards want to go back, um, they're going to go back. Uh, but what about th this other majority of the of the respondents and who say that they're either going to delay or they may not go back for a while? Um, we wanted to know what they're most concerned about. So we wanted to evaluate and get some information as to what's driving their concerns. And as you can see here, we asked this question and gave folks um, a, a number of options and just asked them to rate, you know, from least concerning to most concerning, which one of these different options um, is creating the most concern about going back to a sporting event. And this may not look like uh, a, a great amount of variability from the highest rated concern being the far right, which is the idea that there would be a lack of enforcement of social distancing measures um, compared to the far left, which is sort of the least concerning, which is a lack of testing at the uh, facility, um, lack of testing available generally. Um, what you see from just looking at the statistical analysis of this spectrum is that there are significant differ differences uh, among these, these different uh, factors that people are concerned about. And what we, what we looked at is sort of how different each one of them are and what does it tell us. And, and what you see is that the, 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 the top concern, the lack of social distancing enforcement, it is statistically significantly different than every factor uh, on this list, except for the top three. So the top three are significantly similar. And those kind of cluster together uh, to tell us that what people are really concerned about is social distancing and hand hygiene. That if they can stay far enough away from people and feel secure about that, and that they feel like they have resources available to keep their hands clean, um, those are significant concerns that can be addressed. And then you see the next number down, that 7.53 kind of in the middle, 
other members of the public. That number is significantly different than, uh, than, than the, the bottom four numbers uh, on this spectrum. So people are, are making a, a distinction between lack of testing event facility personnel and members of the public, um, meaning they're, they're not concerned so much about the vendors and the uh, event staff they're gonna be wandering around. They're, they're concerned about other people, other fans who are gonna be doing the same things that they're doing and what that means in terms of their risk level. Do you have anything to add to that? We've talked about this a fair amount before today. Yeah, no, I mean, I think you nailed it, right? You, you, that's not to say that, that these things shouldn't be accounted for, but right, as you look at, listen, we, we, we all know budgets are, are down you know, for, for the institutions, right, for athletic departments. And we look at things we might have to invest in or not, but, but consider, this is interesting, right? It's interesting that, that the, you might immediately jump to uh, making sure all our people, you know, our vendors, our food service folks, focusing on them. When in fact, right, what the public is telling us, what the core fans are telling us is, tell me how I'm gonna stay away from people and still enjoy this, um, right? Again, now we're getting messaging communication points in addition to, uh, you know, plan, execution, um, you know, that we can start to get out in front of. Yeah, and, and so knowing what people are concerned about was also, I think, evaluated in tandem with this next question, which is, so we know what you're concerned about, but what's actually going to make you come to an event? And um, we saw, again, um, the pattern that focuses on social distance and hand hygiene, that those top three answers that, that made the most difference to people saying they would come to an event are about uh, hands-free restroom fixtures, hand washing stations at the, at the gates, and social distancing markers. And again, these numbers um, may not look uh, you know, a lot different to you in value, um, but again, we know that those top three numbers, they cluster together um, and they separate from the numbers below. And I'll tell you that the hands-free restroom fixtures in our analysis, it is statistically different from every other answer in this list. Um, meaning, um, and, and also at the bottom end of the spectrum, empty seats between seats, is also distinct from every other item in this list. And so that, you know, one way to look at that conclusion is if you could only do one thing to make a difference, that hands-free restroom fixtures would be the choice. And if you could do one thing that would not make a difference, it would be uh, telling people you're gonna put one empty seat between them and their neighbor. Um, as Drew said earlier, you know, th there's certainly a discussion to be had about the value of, of, of you know, which one of these or which group of these uh, steps you might take. But um, this analysis, I think, just tells us again that that messaging to folks that you're going to take care of them and, and address their concern about other fans is a top priority. Yeah, and, and the, right, good, good example. People, again, you might jump to no touch, mobile tickets, right? Um, not to in any way, shape or form um, discredit, you know, any other consultants out there. But right, this kind of tells us fans aren't quite as, as worried about that premise, which I certainly would have thought, right? You got to go ticketless or, or whatever. Maybe you don't, right? Instead, maybe you can still have tickets, but you better have hand washing right after that. And it's, and it's probably also worth saying that it, it, in that spectrum, every single one of those uh, measures had an average um, in the positive, that each one of those measures that uh, people said would make a difference. Um, so, you know, we're, we are talking about some, some small distinctions, but some distinctions that, that people said were important. Yeah, so here's another way of looking at it. Kevin's spot on, right? Doing all those things are, are going to be good. Um, again, when we look at communication, messaging, and, and things you, you focus on telling, hey, here's what we're doing, um, right? This tells you the key words and, and key uh, initiatives that people are gonna respond most positively to, to give them peace of mind. Yeah, and we, we mentioned this, so just wanted to make the point that we did see um, some important differences in how people perceive these different issues. Those differences existed in, in our regional analysis. So you see on the screen that 53% of our respondents from the Northeast said that they would not attend uh, an unrestricted event for at least a year or would never attend. And that number in the West was only 38%. Um, it was in, in, the, in the low 40s in the Midwest and the, uh, in the South. So, um, you know, some differences in what people are, are, are saying they would be comfortable with, I think, based on their experience with the virus, on their experience with 
with the thing that they've told us they're most concerned about, which is the concentration of other people. Um, and we also saw some differences with respect to, to age, um, that people's generation mattered in the sense that um, the older fans, especially 65 and older, were the most likely to say that the atmosphere of a live event um, was, was most important. Um, but those fans were also less likely than our younger generations of fans to say, you know, that they're ready to attend an event um, in the next couple of weeks because um, the younger fans are generally less, less afraid um, and they're particularly less afraid of other people. Um, so one of the things that came from our generational analysis was um, that the youngest generation, uh, 18 to 24, were more likely to say that lack of testing is a safety concern than they were uh, th than the older generations were, that, that the older generations tend to be focused on um, protective equipment, hand hygiene, and other people, um, while the younger generations were, um, were less so. And it makes sense from what we see in our experiences. We also found, right, though, younger generations more willing to watch on TV. Is that right? Did, did we mention that? That's right. They, they saw less distinction in the experience uh, of watching on TV compared to being there live. Yeah, which jives with content. Uh, but uh, again, notable as, you, as we look at uh, communicating with fans and setting up a plan. So the realities, right? So what do we do with this? What do we, what do we know, um, right? People may not wanna come back yet to a certain extent, right? Again, I mentioned it, we know budgets are, are an issue. We know there's guidelines out there. And Kevin, this is probably a good moment for you to talk about um, skepticism of, of guidelines. Um, I'm sorry, not of guidelines, but of, I'll have you explain it. You know what I mean? Yeah, are you, are you just talking about kind of the relative skepticism of authority and then what we're seeing with polling about yeah. the government? Yeah, so in some of our other polling, um, as it pertains to the coronavirus response and what you're seeing in national poll, other national polls, is, you know, there is a comparatively stronger, more positive response to um, at the top medical experts and medical officials, followed by public health officials. So these are government people, but with a public health focus, followed by state and local government agencies and officials, followed by the least amount of trust and favorability for federal government uh, individuals and officials. And, and so that polling you know, tells us a couple of things. And in, and in our research, what we've seen is that um, there are different factors that are associated with those different positive or negative ratings, especially of the government agencies. And that what we see is that state and local governments are being more positively rated and viewed based on people's level of fear of the virus, people's experience, direct experience with the virus, people's direct experience with financial consequences of the virus, and people's even things like measures of their anger, their sadness, their anxiety about the pandemic more broadly, that's what's driving people's ratings of state and local officials. And, and what that means is that people's direct experiences of their immediate environments are affecting most their perceptions of the people and agencies most directly around them. And what's driving people's perceptions of the federal government are, are, are more persistent things like politics, like who they vote for, um, like their general belief about the role of government, uh, about their perception of corporations in America. And those things are much less directly tied to anything pertaining to the virus, although we know that you know, at this point, every single entity of, of American culture is having some response to the virus. So you know, that can inform what we're thinking about how uh, sports fans are gonna respond to um, to the guidelines or to the communication they receive from, uh, from you and from your constituents at different levels of, of structure. Um, and, I, and I know, Drew, you have a good point to add to that. Yeah, well, a couple. First, right, so, so take that same premise, right, that people are, are more skeptical of a federal, right, our federal guidelines. You can imagine, I mean it with the utmost respect, the NCA guidelines aren't likely to, to bring a whole lot of peace of mind either or be overly trusted that there's a skepticism that exists for the NCA. Um, so while the guidelines that came out are, are very important and, and certainly focus on your know, student athlete welfare and health, um, it's just important to know how then your local fan base, right? Your supporters are gonna respond to those. Um, 
right? So, so, and then also it puts you in a situation to consider of if your local regional state guidelines are in conflict with your fan sentiment, right? That's the other kind of weird scenario that we'll talk at the very end here, right? So here again, restrictions lifting, but fan base saying I'm, I'm uncomfortable, right? That means maybe are you in a scenario where, where you keep restrictions and guidelines in place, even if they aren't in place um, from, from the local government? Like that's, that's a scenario, right, to talk through. So, so real conclusions, um, right? So there's confusion out there. There's different guidelines everywhere. Uh, there's different guidelines where I live, right, Kansas City, Missouri, then, then let's call it the, the closest football stadium, collegiate football stadium, Lawrence, Kansas, different guidelines. Um, but what we do know, again, is how people feel. And that is really important um, because, right, how we feel is what drives our behavior. So if we can understand that and communicate accordingly and plan accordingly, we can evolve with guidelines. Um, and and yeah, exactly this point, right? We've got to start communicating now. Um, and we'll talk more about that. Uh, good news, right? Our core fan base is there. They're, you know, they are still there to support us. They're still on board, which is great. And they're, from what we can tell, very excited to, to get to go to a sporting event again. Um, conflict is a theme. There's a conflict of, of emotions. And more specifically, fear has a range, right? A little bit afraid versus very afraid has a massive impact when those two people come together in the same place. Um, and, and the fear is driven by other people. Again, we, you, I, I, you, know, you might make assumptions about what people are truly afraid of, and, and that to me is an insightful piece of information. And I'll reiterate this one, uh, that I'm a believer that planning for for future live events, near future live events, should be viewed as temporary, not as long-term permanent solutions. Um, and again, I'm basing that on, on, on history, not, not just on opinion. And therefore, we can look at this time as something novel, make it special, um, right? do something different, um, celebrate the uniqueness of, of the scenario we're in. And ultimately, the folks that do come, depending on when we start, Make them feel special. Make those fans feel like gods. Make this uh, something they'll never forget in a positive way. Um, and, and the kind of last one, right? Even if restrictions are lifted, consider keeping them um, and announce it and communicate it now. Um, communication being the key one. Building safe forums for fans to voice their fear. It's a hard thing to say, I'm afraid of other people, right? That's not something we're, we're accustomed to saying. Um, and it's also weird to say, I'm afraid of other people, but I want to get together with other people. Um, people need to talk and talk about that and not guidelines. And more yet, so that last point is really important. You college athletic departments are fantastic about checking in with your student athletes, checking in with your fan bases, right? You guys communicate as, as well as any group out there. Um, so you're, you're well set up to, to, to ease, ten, ease, ease concerns, ease fears. The soapbox. My only other point in there, just I have to say it, um, right? Unprecedented times means uh, opportunity, right? In historical moments, all bets are off. So don't let normal constraints we have limit creative thinking. Um, you know, whether it be uh, you know contracts, uh, whether it be uh, you know scheduling. You know, we see some changes that folks are making. Yeah, there, it's a good time to try something new. Um, so what's next? kind of summarize this before we get to Q&A quickly. Um, step one, expanding our research. So uh, our asks, if you will, uh, we would love to further our research, especially by region. Um, it'd be also fantastic to kind of pool groups of universities together to research us a little bit further by region. Um, because again, you know, it, it would really help us determine and keep that measurement of fear as we go along. Um, so uh, my contact information is on the next slide. And uh, so please reach out to us if you'd be willing to, uh, to maybe be a part of this, to take this, this further. Um, 
And then, you know, taking the feedback we, ha we have so far and kind of turning that into an actionable plan solutions. I'll show you very quickly, just a simple exercise, right? How, how you can now utilize this. Bear with me. So hopefully, Kevin, you can see my screen. Yep. So good example. To kind of run you through this again, very fast. Scenarios, right? So what are the scenarios we could possibly be dealing with when it comes to an upcoming football um, season? I'm using football as the example, of course, right? Okay, scenario one, no season. That is awful. Worst case scenario. Um, don't even want to talk about it. It's really this one I want to talk about. A season starts, right? Let's pretend it starts on time with no restrictions, but, but our survey and feedback is showing fear is still there, right? So how do we do that? How do we plan for that? Um, and, and this is a sample, an example of how you might do it, right? We make an announcement now that right, we're listening to our student athletes and our fans, right? We, we know people out there are afraid. Um, and it's, it's about, right, taking the precautions that we need to take, you know, to come together, to ease those fears. You know, we're here for you. And if the football season starts on time, this is our plan. We are going to abide by the most stringent guidelines and focus on solutions, right, that we know will ease those concerns. And say, listen, the great news is as, as new information comes out, we've planned in a way that can allow us to reduce those restrictions as we get closer to the season. But to me, making this statement or statement like it now puts us on a path towards success um, versus waiting to see kind of what happens. And you know, even if things get delayed, whatever it may be, we're still ahead of the game and building trust with our fan base that we have this under control. It's okay. You know, when we're ready, you're ready. Or when you're ready, we're ready. Right. And then starting to determine, okay, when do we need to make that decision? In this case, now, you know, what teams, what who do we need to execute on this plan? What expertise are we missing? Right. Then the next communication decision point, right? New information available, June 1. Okay, now we need to reassess and re-message. Um, you know, we're still on, on the path to. Um, right, we're still safe, social distancing is in place, our plan is in place, right, continue down the line. Right, then you're starting to look at, okay, my fan base, I can organize them, right, according to their, their level of concern, right, who, who am I, you know, fan base, what's the demographics of that group, right, and then who does that fit? Is that our major donors? Is that our, you know, typical season ticket holders? And what is most impactful? To, for them to get peace of mind based on our research, right? Social distancing is most important for them. Again, these are just examples. Communication audit, right? How do we communicate now? How much of our fan base do we hit? Which of our you know, groups are trust rating is associated, associated with that medium? And what keywords do we need to be establishing for that group to, again, make sure the message gets out and make sure there's peace of mind? And Right? Do we need a central place to communicate our plans uh, you know, consistently? And then kind of finally, uh, the part I, I described, right? Starting to look at solutions that can be layered in, right? Giving them a rating of value between guidelines and how much impact they have on a fan base based on what we know, right? And coming to a conclusion of tiering our solutions, right? So we know that you know, staff dedicated to enforcing social distancing is going to have one of the biggest impacts on our fan base as we know it now, right? So that's an important, you know, layer one solution, right? You kind of see, again, I'm, I'm just making examples, but now we can start to layer in solutions um, that, that are effective, efficient, um, and again, are going to build us to, to, a, to a successful uh, moment when, when things go live. And then finally, we can start to assess risk on you know, how much exposure is occurring in given areas of a stadium, arena, whatever it may be, um, right? And kind of what the role is. Is it a cultural issue? Is communication issue? Um, is it a facility issue? So uh, this again is a, is a kind of a, a simple pass, a simple exercise on how uh, you know, we can help you plan, how you, know, how you can start to plan, uh, get ahead of this, um, right? Without, without knowing everything. So. That's, uh, that's kind of the rundown. Again, this is us. This is me. Um, please reach out on, on any of those fronts um, to uh, see if we can, uh, if, if you guys want to be a part of the further research um, and or, you know, help to start plan for, for the upcoming season.
think that covers us. Did I miss anything, Kevin? I don't think so. I've been just taking a peek at some of the questions that folks have submitted, and I, I, uh, I've tried to categorize them a little bit um, in groups so we can maybe start to address a few. So I'll, I'll kick one off that I think um, that you're probably you know best positioned to start the answer. And the question is um, how to balance the timeline of communication um, with you know with what guidelines may come. Um, and I'm, I'm changing that question a little bit, but I think, I think the idea is, um, you know, how do we balance the goal of getting out ahead of it with um, the potential that, um, that we don't know yet what the guidelines might eventually become? Yeah, sorry. So that, Kevin, you're asking me to answer that, is that what you're saying? Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. well, that, I think that's, that's, I guess that's a question I think that we're, that we're talking about that's yeah. close to the facility and to the communication. Um, of getting out front and yeah and so you know to me there's a commitment to that again that so it's opinion but it's based on right our findings based on what we know and then it's also based on my understanding my background is communications marketing public relations so right so so having a plan that of in my mind should be worst case scenario right which is a a the worst case scenario is actually on some way in some ways no restrictions are technically in place um, you have locally, regionally, yet the, the fear is still there. That's the one to me that's kind of the, the weirdest, craziest, strangest one. And if I was an athletic director, I would commit to a, a fully um, restricted, right, stadium. I'd commit to the, the model of uh, we are going to do all of these things still regardless um, because we know our fans are worried still. Um, and we're not going to be a part of, of making it worse. Um, you know, I, I'm sorry, but that's, we want this to be good. Um, and now the good news is though, as long as the solutions, as long as the, the plan that's in place are not really extensive, expensive, right? Solutions, you can tear those out, right? You can pull out those layers. Um, if you know social distancing or masks, right? Or uh, temperature scanners, whatever it may be, become less of a concern. And I would tack onto that, you know, another question that we that we received is essentially about um, by talking about all the steps you're taking, are you are you just creating uh, fears in people or reminding people of why they should be afraid to come to the event? And in my response to that is, um, you know, I think what our I, th I think what we have seen and what these survey questions tell us is that these these concerns are already there, right? That you're not creating them um, and you're probably not uh, making them worse than they already are in people's minds. And, and really what this, these surveys are telling us is that um, people are able to identify which components of the fears are the most concerning and least concerning. And so um, I, it's kind of an elephant in the room position for me is, is you're gonna be better off uh, People that you know that they feel these things, or at least at some level, they're having these experiences, and that you are accounting for that. Um, and your your answer to what you're doing doesn't have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be in uh, You doesn't have to be complete. But what the audience, I think, is telling us they want to know is that we are listening, and that we know that they have these concerns, and that there are things that can be done. Yep. And and so the other question that, that kind of I think is coming up is is how do you how do you have an atmosphere and still have social distancing? How do you enforce social distancing? And what I really am saying is, it's a, it'd be a varying degree of percentage, but you're committing to partial uh, uh, partial capacity, right? You have to assess what you can truly, how many people you can have in a, in a facility and, and still manage the social distancing, which you are effectively saying, um, I am committed to limited capacity, um, right? Based on, uh, on this very, major concern um, but it, but in turn we're going to we're going to make this special right we're going to have fun with it for lack of a better phrase right to make this environment while not the normal you know side by side raucous environment we're going to find other ways to make this special it, but novel right again for a season two seasons you know worst case scenarios right that, that that is that's part of the compromise here part of overcoming the conflict is compromise the compromise is Yep, we're going to commit to partial capacity, and I realize that's uncomfortable. Don't get me wrong, but but it's like it's honest. I guess is the best way I can put it. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think with the, with this question of how do you create the desired atmosphere when you can't have people doing what they usually do um, could come with sort of a crowdsourcing solution where part of your idea is to say, our number one goal is to get as many of you as we can back to the experience that you like. And part of part of creating that experience that you like is participating in the way that you think can, can make it great. Um, so, you know, that's another response to treating these, these sports fans like gods, but also empowering them with some, you know, ability to, 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 to make it, to make it greater, to make it even better than it used to be. Um, and, you know, and, and that could take various forms from, from social media to, to live action, to, um, to other things. But I think that that's, that's, that's a way of looking at it like a creative uh, opportunity. Yeah. And, you know, the other layer to that, right. So, so student sections, right, often drive atmosphere of, a, of the in-game environment, right? They're usually the craziest, most raucous, so on and so forth. If there's a scenario as well that allows for a certain section or sections, right, depending on what regulations are in place, to actually just be normal, right, because all of those people agree, you know, to go into that section and, and, and be normal, while wow, you can, you know, then separate other fans that are not comfortable with that, right? You can start to divide up your, your facility according to that as well, um, depending on what, what level's in place. But otherwise, what Kevin said is spot on, right? We, we're going to look at some novel ways to, uh, to create an environment that is different um, without trying to be uh, the normal atmosphere that we have. Acknowledge that it's different. I'm missing lacunae. Sorry, just, just reading here. Yeah, so the one, uh, a couple of things that are coming up, legal action, that piece, I do think it's an important part. Um, and while Kevin works with lawyers, not a lawyer, and I most certainly am not, um, but I do think it's another layer of, of, of the conversation we've talked a lot about. Um, and truly that's one uh, that we'll table for sort of our next exercise as we look into that expertise. Um, sorry, I'm looking. Uh, sorry, I see one question here. Looking at surveys show concern about enforcing social distancing, but not yet as not as concerned with having seats open in between each other. To clarify in the survey, basically people are saying one seat in between me doesn't do anything. You have to truly have six feet in between me for, for it to matter. It's basically what the survey is telling us. Yeah, another data specific question on the uh, on the board was. Um, you know, are people expressing openness to participating in events if there are measures in place? And the answer to that is, is yes, that, you know, really what we saw was um, about 39% said they would be willing to attend a sporting event in the next two to five months if there were no restrictions. And as you add in different restrictions like masks, that number goes from 39% to 51%. When you add in a restriction like half capacity, it goes up to 53%. Um, and when you extend that two to five months out to six months, you know, those numbers go up. So what you're essentially seeing is that there are some measures that are preferable to others, but that with the passage of time, um, all these measures become, um, you know, more adequate. Um, just looking at a couple other ones. The um, one is about balancing timeline of trust communication now in the public vitriol um, putting out anything before government guidelines are in place. I realize it's a lot to ask to kind of put yourself out there in that way. My feeling on this one is that, um, you know, being over cautious typically serves us pretty well. And, um, right. I think ultimately, um, being out in front of this from using the messaging that, I have, I'm backed by actual feedback from my fan base that says they are afraid, right? That's what I'm using to make this decision, um, right? Or from student athletes. I'm not, right? I understand the guidelines that are out there, um, but those guidelines are not taking into account public sentiment in that way. Um, I am, right? So while I, we certainly will be respectful of the guidelines, I'm going to listen to my fan base. And, and my fan base is telling me they are afraid. 
All right, guys. Well, we're coming up at the end of our hour here um, from the NACTA team. I just want to, again, thank Drew and Kevin for their time today, sharing your expertise with us. Um, and thank you to all the members who were able to join on Zoom and YouTube and over the phone. We appreciate um, your participation and we look forward to having you online with us again soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all.